<laughs> hey, Big T, what's up? Uh, the cricket's not. The cricket's hanging in the balance. <laughs> I should really be watching cricket right now. <gasps> if you weren't, I'd be disappointed. In fact, in fact, maybe get a stream going on your phone while we chat. <laughs> I've got more than one screen. At least you're being truthful. I don't want to give the impression that I'm not 100% focused on, on you. <laughs> but if a wicket falls... I might burst into tears. So where are you? You look like you're somewhere large. I, <laughs> somewhere large and in charge. I'm at church working, okay. trying, to nail a, trying to nail a deadline that is not going to happen. You know, I had a, you know, I had a cricket friend slash mentor in the States from Sydney who had oh. the wisdom collection of about the almanac. He had like, okay. I don't know how many wisdom almanacs and he would reference them like by specific volume to show me these certain facts and like entries. And he wow. introduced me to Richie Benno and he introduced wow. me to the dream team. Cause being from Sydney, like the nineties dream team with Shane Warren and all those. Oh, yeah. And we went to the world cup at a bar in Boston in Cambridge near Harvard and watched the Aussies beat Sri Lanka in that okay. was maybe 2004 was the World, okay. was the World Cup or 2005. Yeah. And I made a Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi t-shirt <laughs> at, the, at the bar. And uh, so you yeah. support the enemy. You support the enemy. Um, well, there, the, each evil empire is just a matter of degree, and it feels like Australia is less of an evil empire at this point. Yeah, so I once played uh, a gig in Delhi in India to 10,000, well, probably 10,000 people. I mean, nobody counted them, but it was a lot of people. And India just won um, the World Cup. Oh, and my I was able to tell... That, 10,000 Indians that winning at sport doesn't create any spiritual growth. Whereas <laughs> losing, losing at sport, especially when you're passionate about it, forces you to deal with some gnarly elements of reality in the universe and makes you grow spiritually. Where are you from in the US, first of all? So I'm an East Coaster. I grew up just north of Boston in okay. the Boston suburbs. Right next to Salem, Massachusetts, which city? In a town called Beverly. 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 So are you, are you like Peter Griffin, basically? <laughs> no, that's Rhode Island. They're a total different breed. Okay. Are you like Peter Griffin? Well, I <laughs> allegedly look like him, apparently. People have said that. People I've never met before have come up and said to me, you look like Peter Griffin. So, um, okay, so... And you, how did you, and you, your, your parents, your mother was musical? Yes, still is. Jazz? Actually, both my parents are super musical. My dad is, he's an, he, he has an incredible relationship to classical music. Like, it's really intense. Like, he would tell you which, which is the definitive recording. Okay. Uh, a particular piano sonata or an orchestra work. And he'd tell you who are the players to listen to. Like he knows his repertoire and he loves it. And on road trips in the van across the States, he'd put like the B minor mass on blast while conducting and singing the parts. Like really like, so. While driving. Know. Oh yeah. So he's. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So now, listen, two now, hands. now listen for the oboe entrance. Oh yeah. Big style. Steering with his knees. Oh yeah. To get the. <laughs> My mum used to steer with her knees when she she put on makeup while driving wow. and steer with her knees, and she once uh, drove in France with her eyes shut because she's scared of thunderstorms. And actually, at that point, my set myself and my sister both had driving licenses, and she still claimed that her driving with her eyes shut was safer than us driving anyway oh, um, her makeup job at that point must have been a wreck with her eyes closed well no she, <laughs> she wasn't 
<laughs> she wasn't doing the makeup. She was just driving with her eyes closed. <sighs> so that sounds so. But so I had that on the one hand, and then my mother went to Berkeley in the seventies, and she would say, "Oh, you know, check out this record." I remember finding Bill Bruford. Berkeley record. School of Music. Berkeley School, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not in California. Um, and so she was there during like fusion era and she loved all that stuff and showed it to me. I remember finding Bill Bruford's Gradually Going Tornado record uh, in the house, which is a killer record, unbelievable record. I know that record. Um, check it out. It's got okay. the unknown John Clark on guitar. That's how he's listed. The unknown John Clark. I'll play a bit about under this part of the, if I can find it. Bill Bruford, what's it called? Gradually Going Tornado. Okay. And she was sure. really influenced by that record, like, and Weather Report. She gave me um, kind of blue and Weather Report when I was like 13 and said, check this out. But she liked everything and she liked different stuff. Like she would be the, the one who didn't have a copy of Handel's Messiah. She had like a copy of black musicians playing Handel's Messiah doing their arrangements. So she had like, it had like Stevie Wonder singing one of the arias and like the Yellow Jackets doing stuff like, so she was always into different stuff. And the two of them just had a really passionate relationship to music. My mom, my earliest memories are playing under the grand piano while she was doing her piano improvisations and stuff. So it was just- She's, she's a jazzer really, she's a jazzer. She's a mixer actually, which is probably where I get my view of music. So she wasn't pure anything. She was a little bit this, a little bit that, a little bit all, you know, she didn't fit the category. So I think that's probably where my outlook comes from in a big way. Why did you, you get into being a musician and did you study and how did you become, are you a jazz musician? If so, <laughs> how did you become a jazz musician? If not, uh, what are you? Uh, the last one I can't answer, but I do know that I got exposed to a lot of different stuff. So my parents shipped me off to the New England Conservatory like preparatory program on Saturdays while my pals were playing baseball. And, you know, and it, it was a big shift. Like there was a point where I was there from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. doing okay. choir, brass quartet, lessons, theory, three hours of orchestra. It was like a full on day. You know, I was there because that was what, me and my siblings did and I liked it, but I wasn't super passionate classical musician. I know, I remember walking- Was that, was that a classical thing? Yeah, yeah, it was all classical. Um, they had a jazz program, including Peter Evans, who is for like avant-garde jazz. For me, he's like on the Mount Rushmore of all time. And he's, 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 he's my age, maybe like four years older. He was at that program when I was there, and I remember walking by the recital hall, and they'd leave the door open and play really loud just to annoy all the classical dudes. And he was doing stuff that was blew my mind. I remember just being like, "What is that?" You know. But I didn't really jump on board with jazz until later. Um, when you realized how much money was involved and how great <laughs> it was for meeting women. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I saw the light. Um, no, you know, both women and men. Um, okay, so did you did you study music once you left school? I did two years of composition, and I flunked out of school. I wasn't ready for it at all. And uh, I came home and worked at a paint factory and did these pretty dire jobs and realized like this this is this is no bueno. So I went back to. Uh, study, but it was totally different. It was like I did teaching high school English for four years, like total detour. And so I was studying thinking, composition, but then you did you just sort of not work, or did you try but you failed? What? How did you flunk? What I just the, I like I I was just I was not. I think the word is dysfunctional. So, okay. you know. Like I wouldn't make it, I just wouldn't show up to class okay. or my final exam. Or That's the best anything. way to flunk is just not try. <laughs> it's better to, to try, to not try and flunk rather than try really hard and flunk because that's more worrying. Well, I don't know, I mean. No, because that's, you know, if you, if you grow up a bit and you, you know, then you, nobody knows if you're shit 
if you don't show up. Okay. But you're but you, you're kind of you're kind of a waste of space. Like at least the guy who really like is trying, you there's pity points, you know. Um <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm I'm with you. I I think that that's the way to do it. So you it sounds a bit like that Matt Damon film. So you you kind of working in a pain factory, but a little bit of <laughs> dreaming about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm just a mathematical genius, but I need therapy. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I, I, I thought what, but I was doing music the whole time I was in bands and, uh, writing music and, and like lots of different music. I was in a kind of an, uh, electronic noise band and, um, writing songs and kind of singer songwriter style. So doing lots of different stuff. Um, and then I yeah did the teaching English thing. And at that time I met my now wife, um, which really derailed the plans because, She's yeah, Palestinian and was living here, and we were trying to. We knew we were gonna be in, in Scotland. Yeah, she was. She was in Glasgow for a year and then moved to Edinburgh. So we, where, 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 where did you meet her? In, in, it, it, in, she, um, she, she went to uni uh, near where I was living. In in the states. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you were brought to Scotland by the love of a woman. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> terrible idea. I tried to talk all young musicians out of romance of any kind because it takes your mind off the the music. Yeah, like why do real life when you can, you know, focus on learning your scales? Exactly. <laughs> and children also take up a huge amount of time and they're just annoying. <laughs> it's difficult to practice when they're sleeping there's loads of reasons why it's just a terrible idea I and mean, we're obviously blessed that that happened because you're now in scotland with your tremendous gifts you really are quite a one of a kind composer you're very very unique do you have any sort of explanation or i guess everything you said so far sort of explains it somewhat but how that came about is it just because of your upbringing or what, what I, I feel i feel like a lot in the in in music in general you're only allowed to be good at something if you say no to everything else i mean it's different now where people are really conversant in a lot of different genres and styles of music but i do feel like there's a sense of well if you're a jazzer you have to kind of sneer at folk music and think it's kind of lame and simplistic and stupid oh no not here you, don't. <laughs> you know what i mean like but I just have a genuine, I kind I of think that, like, I, I, I mean, I think that applies in many parts of the world, but not in the Scot, not in Scotland. A lot of Scottish jazz musicians have tremendous respect for folk musicians and even marry them. Well, Scotland, I even, uh, Scotland has like outrageously amazing folk musicians, but like yeah. th there'll be genres that people either miss or ignore or disdain or don't understand. But I think, because I got to play in a lot of different styles and, and bands, I didn't want to like fully leave them. I kind of wanted to carry them with me. So I guess I see jazz as the arena in which to throw all this stuff in because I yes. love the ethos of high risk. I love conversational nature of it. I love that it's never going to be the same twice, but the sound that I'm interested in is, uh, comes from all these different sources. So it's like, what would circus music be like with a jazz sextet? What would a chorale be like? Yes. What would a hoedown be like? The thing is, you've been in Scotland for quite a long time, but you sort of didn't really make yourself known to the jazz scene. That's how it appeared anyway. Um, I think I'm a slow burner. I don't think I was very good. I mean, I still don't think I'm very good, but I think, well, okay, in terms of composition, it for jazz musicians it was on i was telling this to mario the other night it was because of playtime that that really flowered so i i was kind of writing but i didn't have people to write for and i went to see you guys and the first time it was you're doing all your own tunes which i thought was brilliant and it'd be like here's a tune mario wrote here's a tune tom wrote here's a tune martin wrote. and they were all totally different and i thought here's a bunch of people that are up for you know, diversity, but still unity and being a band and taking risks. So I went home that night and I wrote a bunch of tunes for you. And I thought, for example, like with uh, Hank Rolls a Strike, I thought, 
how would Martin sound playing over those changes? So that's why I wrote that tune. Um, and it was, I really, through seeing you guys play that, the compositional side, I thought, I was just, it just, it just happened. Just, it, but we know. didn't know you at that point, so did you go, and, how did you actually, did you, did you speak to Graham first? No, I thought that my goal was, you know, you have, a, you have a different feature every week. And my goal was, I wouldn't, I, I thought there's no way I'd be able to play horn with these guys. But what I might be able to do is be like a composer one week. So like, you know, were you, like, so were you like standing outside the movie, <laughs> smoking, hoping that one of us would strike up a conversation? <laughs> I, I, I might sing one of my tunes to see if it catches their ear. Did you have a sort of strategy for... I used my powers of hypnosis. Um, how did it happen? So, I think it was kind of one by one. So Graham uh, played Graham first, he, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he jumped on board first, and then yourself, and then we got the other two fellows. Well, it's really been a great thing uh, to, to kind of be in this process of your music moving through these evolutionary levels. And um, uh, it's great to have you back at Playtime uh, we've just recorded an album, and I don't know how that's sounding, but... Um, uh, oh! We've lost the wicket! No! No! Joe Root's out! <laughs> that's a disaster. And with that, it's over. <laughs> disaster. <laughs> um, yeah, so... This actually is going to be going out in the interval of the gig, so how did you feel about the first set? Unbelievable. <laughs> wow, what a <laughs> can we try that again? What am I supposed to say when it's going out at the interval? Oh, it's a it's a it's a traditional question, you know. <laughs> All right, well listen, John, thank you so much for uh, everything and looking forward to the second set. I hope that it carries on in the same or even you know bigger. And uh, all right, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.